we all know uh, the purposes of courts and how important courts are in our society. And the big question I always have is, how do we know that we're still pursuing those? How do we know that we're, in, we're pursuing those, those lofty purposes of courts and, and staying on track? Uh, one of the ways that through my career that I've become convinced that that is, is by putting a framework in place that, uh, let's see, somewhere I'm supposed to. Did I get it? All right. Is to put a framework in place that helps you keep organized. And we're gonna talk about two frameworks today, two quality management systems, and they're not the only ones. Uh, there's others around the world, and there's others that come out of the business community. But we wanna take two of these frameworks today and talk about them. The International Framework for Court Excellence, which I was been a part of uh, developing, and the High Performance Court Frameworks, which really evolved around the court tools. Uh, and we want to talk about those things, but I want just very briefly to talk about, you know, why we want to have those. What value is there to these quality cycles? You know, the one more, number one reason, as uh, we discussed as we put both of these together, was to have a place where we could pull all the tools together that we need in a quality management system. All the tools. Have you ever been involved with a project that you get all consumed, you're going headstrong, all of a sudden another problem comes up, the budget's falling apart, you know, the judge comes in and says, we're gonna pursue this. Two weeks later, there's something else coming on. And how do you juggle the ball and keep moving, all those balls and keep moving at the same time? And at the same time, know that you're making progress, that you're just not spinning the wheels. The other purpose of these frameworks is to assess our court's strengths and weaknesses. But when, I, the, but when I'm in an elevator and somebody asks me about what about the international framework for, for court excellence, and it's typically somebody that doesn't know courts, I t I'd explain it this way. It's a method or a tool to one, diagnose a problem, create a prescription to cure that problem, and evaluate it. And what you see up here is a quality cycle. And this quality cycle would apply to almost any framework, where you start with an assessment, you come up with some solutions, you measure the solutions, but the key, the key is continually continuous improvement, because this ultimately is a marathon, and it's not a sprint. Let's see, very good. Very briefly, I want to talk about some of the, the uh, contrasts uh, and the uh, commonalities between the two. And it all starts with values. You know, what are the values that we have? In the international framework, there's, we have, there are 10 values. There's equality, fairness, the impartiality, the ability to make independent decisions. Uh, in, the, um, in the high performance court, there's four administrative principles, uh, typically uh, that we're all familiar in the states around, uh, uh, around uh, um, uh, case flow management, you know, giving individual cases attention, proportionality, uh, those things. So you, those kind of compare and, and contrast. Uh, the areas of excellence, and all this is material is all on the website. So I want to give a very high level because getting into the discussion with the panel is more even is the most important part today. Uh, but you have seven areas of excellence in the high performance courts framework: quality, fairness, impartiality. In the high performance court area framework, there's ten uh, perspectives on excellence from internal and external that work around the court tools. There's about resources and public trust and confidence. So it's orchestrated around there. Um, sustainability, both models look at the, uh, that quality cycle. And in, in the uh, performance measures, because each one you have to measure how are you doing on this journey. 
And of course, in the high performance court framework, we're looking at court tools. In the international framework, uh, we've developed a set of, of global measures. Ingo Kylitz, and I believe he, later he'll be talking about those, a set of global measures. The court tools, some of those measures are more uh, US specific. Um, and uh, finally, a comparison about the use of data. The, uh, the international framework is not as heavily data driven. You can be a court that doesn't have any data and move towards excellence. And I think uh, Violaine Othman, Othman is going to talk about how that worked in, in Bangladesh. The high performance court framework, since it's been created around the court tools, is really more data driven and data focused. But they both have the same thing in mind. And ultimately, they are tools to take us from performance measure to performance management. So with that, I want to quickly introduce the panel. And uh, very briefly, uh, many of you know these, uh, these folks. It's a terrific international, international panel. Pim Albers is going to facilitate the discussion. Uh, he's an international consultant and uh, was one of the original people involved with developing the international framework. Uh, he's worked with CPES uh, uh, for years and does uh, much international consulting now. Uh, Greg Reinhardt on the far side there is the executive director of their Australia, Austra Austral Asian Institute for Judicial Administration. He's currently the chair of the International Consortium, Consortium for Court Excellence, the group that really sponsors and promotes the international framework. Uh, we have VLA Nothman, who is our senior advisor and senior programmer, program manager for the National Center International Programs. Uh, she's worked in justice systems in Europe, North Africa, Asia. She's currently the project director of uh, USAID, uh, the National Center's USAID project in Bangladesh where they've implemented the international framework. And then Matt Kleiman, who is our principal research consulting consultant in our research division in Williamsburg, who has vast experience uh, in workload measurement, working with court tools and with the high performance court. He also has much international uh, experience. Um, so with that, I'm going to get off the stage and let these, uh, this panel of experts uh, really get into a, a very fruitful discussion of this. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. It makes my work as a moderator more challenging, of course, uh, given the time that is available for the presentation. Um, as you know, I am one of the uh, initiators of this international framework of court excellence. So when it comes to the battle between the high court performance framework and the international framework of court excellence, I know which model is the best, but I was promised to be uh, neutral in this uh, panel discussion. Um, and what you heard this morning, in fact, was also really an interesting conversation about fighting injustice, but you also introduced, there has been words introduced about values, court values, which are applicable uh, in all the courts around the world, independence, integrity, fairness, uh, accountability, transparency, and so on. Also to focus on cultures in courts, uh, court performance, accessibility and affordability. And I think these aspects are the main elements of both models. And today in the, in the panel, uh, you'll find the presentations uh, which provide you an overview of the uh, high court performance framework, how it works in practice, but also the international framework of court excellence. And bearing that in mind, I would like to invite now Matt Kleiman as one of the first speakers to introduce the high court performance framework and in order to contrast that with the uh, experiences of the other model. Matt, go ahead. Well, first off, I would like to thank the organizers from NACOM and IACA. I think my experiences mirror as many of yours that it's been a really energizing and engaging conference where we've gotten to meet many people here from the United States as well as many of our international visitors. So thank you first to our organizers and hosts. Uh, and I'd like to just begin by referencing briefly some of the remarks that were made during the opening plenary. So the Chief Justice from uh, the District of Columbia 
asked a, or, or made a, a statement, which was, how do we assess how we're doing and what we're doing? So part of this idea of these frameworks is, as Dan noted, to develop this notion of continuing improvement. At the root of the high performing court framework is the idea that all courts can do better. So there is no per se court of excellence or the highest performing court. There could be higher performing courts. So that's just a first point. Uh, the chief judge from Belize told a very compelling story about developing a case management system. And as part of that development, he discussed the need to utilize data to begin to answer questions. He talked about a process of collecting data manually that took three months. And then there was questions about the reliability of that data to even begin to think about questions. So as Dan noted, the high performing court framework has at one of its core and its roots this notion that we're going to measure using performance measurement to inform this notion of performance management to improve how our operations are doing. So in a similar vein, I'm just curious, uh, if I just ask a quick question, how many people are wearing those little Fitbits that count how many steps you're taking? Okay, so a number of you are wearing those. And in essence, what that's doing is giving you a measurement of what an expectation of how many steps one should take during a day, which might be 10,000 steps, to feel like you're improving your health. That measurement, obviously, then is going to change potentially some of the ways that you act. It's late in the day and you only have 5,000 steps, you feel a little bit of anxiety and you're gonna wanna walk more to ensure that you meet your goal. So by measuring, essentially, you're assessing what goals you want to meet, and you're thinking about how to achieve some of those goals. Uh, Chief Justice Minton from Kentucky talked about this notion that an era of anecdotes is over, that it's very critical to base, especially resource requests, by grounding those in, in empirical data or evidence-based practices. We know that uh, it's also an opportunity to utilize these performance measures to be prioritizing what activities you're going to be utilizing in a world of limited resources. Obviously, courts don't have unlimited fundings. They have to prioritize what initiatives they're going to take, but also target specific activities within their courts or jurisdictions of areas where they might be able to perform or to improve their performance of their operations. A court that tries to do 100 initiatives at once will probably accomplish few of those initiatives. A court that tries to take uh, reform and prioritize and utilize those limited resources to that area, very important. Uh, just a couple more defining elements of what, a, what characterize a high performing court. Uh, from the high performing court framework perspective, there is no one best way of doing things. Each court, of course, has its own cultural and context that they operate within. So while it's important to be looking out to the external environment and hearing at conferences like this what other courts are doing, the process of innovation and improvement is much more complicated and is relying on a lot of the local context that takes place in your own jurisdictions, either system-wide or at a particular trial court le level. Uh, some of the other discussants through this conference have talked about the need to create a collegial environment to draw in the leaders, be they the judges, the administrators, and court staff into this conversation about what improvement means for your court and how you would like to get there. Uh, and I'll just end on this point, and certainly we can have further discussions, which is that Change is very difficult. And we heard about some of, again, the Chief Justice from Belize talked about the resistance to the development of technology. And that these efforts need to be well thought out, well planned, bring together many stakeholders to the table to ensure that there's a common vision of what it is that one's trying to achieve, and again, how to get there. And the high performing, uh, the High Performing Court framework provides a set of steps that are very flexible uh, 
to assess how one is currently doing and provides a roadmap of how one can get there. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, now I would like to pass on the word to uh, Greg, because he was also one of the founder, founding fathers of the International Framework of Court Excellence, and he will provide you more insight about the uh, practice and application of the International Framework of Court Excellence in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Tim. I'd also like to extend my thanks to the organisers, a wonderful attendance and a wonderful conference. I would, um, at the outset, like to promote a document which I think you have amongst um, your materials and it's available on um, the IFCE website and that is a document prepared by uh, my colleague Dr Liz Richardson um, who does the day-to-day uh, -day hands on things in relation to the IFCA, IFCE at my office in Melbourne and it's entitled The Use, Modification and Impact of the International Framework for Court Excellence, a Research Paper. And um, if you look at that, uh, I think you'll get a very good overview of the framework and how it's been implemented, where it's been implemented, how successful it's been. For example, um, uh, it takes you back to the establishment of the framework in, I think it was 2008, um, talks about the framework, talks about the membership of the consortium that has developed and continues to look at and develop the framework, um, looks at the current use modification and impact of the framework and then uh, deals with the uh, way in which the framework has been used or rolled out in a number of jurisdictions both in Australia and throughout the world. Um, so I'd commend that document to you for those of you who come new to the framework or just become involved in it because it does give you a very good overview of what's been happening um, uh, since 2008 in relation to the development of the framework. One thing I'd like to emphasise in relation to the success of the framework is the significance of the uh, head of jurisdiction, chief justice, chief judge, whoever it may be, tribunal head, um, uh, the, the leadership of that person in relation to the implementation of the framework. Unless the head of jurisdiction is actively involved in promoting it and um, carrying with him or her all of his or her judges or court administrators, then I don't think it's really going to work all that well. And of course that's a two-way street because it's not just the, the Chief Justice who's going to be very actively involved, it gives an opportunity to judges and to court administrators to also participate in a process which is going to lead to greater efficiency and quality in relation to the courts. So that's an important factor as well. And um, Matt spoke about collegiality. I think that the framework does, in a very real sense, promote directly and indirectly collegiality in courts. Being a single judge or a single tribunal member um, is, I think, often a very lonely thing. And the use of the framework, the implementation of the framework, does in fact provide each and every person in the system with the opportunity to uh, make their comments and to make their views known in relation to how best to enhance the quality of a court or a tribunal. So that's a very important aspect of it. Um, so I emphasise that as a very significant thing and ask you to um, bear that in mind. Thank you, uh, Greg, for the uh, introduction. Um, then I would like to hear from Violaine about how and why the framework was being applied on inter uh, international court excellence in Bangladesh. What were the experiences? What went good? What went wrong? Maybe you can tell a bit more about that. Thank you, Pim. Um, first, I, I'd like to echo some of the comments that have been made by Matt and, and Greg. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that all courts are performing and they're somewhere on a track to achieving better and higher performance. And through collegiality, through leadership, um, we can sometimes do more with less. That was one of the reasons why in discussions with the Bangladeshi judiciaries, we decided to look into excellence. Um, 
Bangladesh, as, as some of you may know, is a country that's very poor. Its judiciary um, is lacking in resources, is almost entirely manual, um, has clearly not enough judges for its caseload, but that doesn't stop it from being a judiciary. It carries out a number of essential functions like judiciaries everywhere in the world. It resolves dispute, it enforces the law, it protects rights. And the International Framework for Court Excellence presented a set of 10 values that have some degree of universality and echoed with what Bangladeshi judges felt about their judiciary. Fairness, efficiency, uh, independence in decision making, um, et cetera. So the, the general framework that it presented was recognizable and was something that they felt they could aspire to. Um, and then in the Asia region, there's the presence of Singapore. And Singapore is perceived in many ways as the gold standard, as something that you should strive to, to go towards. And through the, the various exchanges of chief justices and judges and, and others in the justice sector communities, there's a lot of exposure to Singapore and its process towards excellence. And so the, the idea of excellence became something that could be discussed. It was not yet a possibility. Um, and we used the process that the IFC offers to start a discussion, to start building kind of a collegial environment where judges can exchange about their common problems and try to move from a negative perception of their own problems to something maybe a little bit more constructive that can lead towards an improvement, the identification of something that could be a solution. And I'll give a couple examples about what the IFC enabled um, the Bangladeshi judges who participated in the discussions to do. Um, there were about five key challenges to starting any discussion on change or reform. And they were, first, the perceived inability to effect change as an individual judge. A perceived uniqueness, our system, our procedures are different, we cannot do um, what has been done elsewhere. Overwhelming caseload and overwhelming backlog, a lack of resources to be able to implement change, and lack of time, which maybe is even more critical. And I think maybe many of you will recognize your own systems in some of those challenges. But through discussion, we moved from nothing can be done, we moved from I have no authority to I have certain things that are under my control, maybe I can affect those. So we move from everything is different to we share the same values. Maybe we can try to implement some things that help us get closer to those values. We move from our backlog is huge and we will never reduce it to maybe we can try to start chipping away at it. And the idea that came out of this was that change all of a sudden became possible. And the first step towards those values, towards excellence were taken. And then, as was mentioned at the beginning by Dan, it all, you enter this quality improvement cycle. You take that first step and then you do it again. You identify the next problem, you prioritize, you come up with a solution and you do it again. Thank you, Violin. Uh, I can imagine that after these introductions, you still don't have a clue what it is. International Framework of Court Excellence and High Court Performance Framework. That's why maybe if you are very enthusiastic, I want to have it in my court as well, what to do? And that's why I want to ask uh, Matt, for example, if you want to introduce the High Court Performance Framework in your court, where to start? What should you do? Shall I call Matt or do I have to look on the website? What steps do you take? Sure, I think that the first step, like as I mentioned in my previous comments, is to uh, have a conversation in your court or your jurisdiction that there is a demand or a desire for change. And it's beginning to assess current practice and begin to understand which direction that the court would like to go. From the National Center for State Courts, as an example, we have some tools that help measure and understand this idea of court culture. And what we often learn from the cultural analyses is that there is a uh, high degree of autonomy and individual sense of that each courtroom is 
all that judges care about. But then when we discuss with them and we work through these exercises, what we find out, in fact, is that they would prefer that the court as a whole be treated or thought of as an organization that should be working together towards common goals. So after identifying that there is a preferred movement towards improvement, developing some working groups made up of uh, judges, administrators, as well as staff. Uh, we're fortunate here, a friend of mine, Kevin Bowling from a court in Michigan has uh, implemented a, a process just like this, where there is dialogue, not just from the top down, but from the bottom up, from staff to judges, to begin to understand what I'd mentioned in my talk, this context, from which what are the barriers to improvements, what are the barriers to change, but also to begin to prioritize what direction and where these resources should be placed to. So the National Center for State Courts is part of the High Performing Court Framework, has developed a 100-item survey. As Dan mentioned, there are 10 areas related to the high-performing court framework. There are 10 questions related to each of these areas that begin a, a sense of where the perception among judges, administrators, and staff may be where improvement could be made. So that's just one subjective point of view on where things may be working well and where things may not be working well. When an area is identified as maybe needing improvement, that's where one can again begin to dig into these, to the data to enter into the quality cycle that Dan suggested. So we see that there's a problem and we think, for example, that there may be a problem with uh, delay or cases taking too long for a certain type of case type. So there's one dimension which might be timeliness, but we also might want to survey court users to get their perspective on this. And in fact, we find out that court users, the litigants, are disturbed as well and aren't feeling like they're receiving justice in a timely fashion. So it's affecting procedural satisfaction. So we have some empirical data we can bring back to these working groups to begin to think about what certain strategies or uh, interventions might be to enact change. Uh, Part of that change process is communicating that information, the data to both internal and external stakeholders to build up support for whatever that change may be, that intervention. And then a critical point that Dan noted was this idea of remeasuring after the fact to make sure that your change is actually doing what you hoped it would do. In this case, reducing the time to disposition of this particular case type. And at the same time, we resurvey court users and find out that uh, litigants are much more pleased with the system and process that's taking place. So really, the, to answer, come back to Penn's original question, the entry point is a desire to be better and to improve the administrative operations of your court. Having that desire is the beginning point for all of this because again, if we believe that this information, most of it should be rooted in empirical data, collecting that data is time consuming, ensuring that it's reliable and consistent is time consuming, but the beauty of that is the, the payoff, the communication of why that's important to the clerk staff, to the court staff, is that this information is going to be utilized to assess how well we're doing and to inform how we can be doing things better. Thank you. Could I just uh, yeah. add to uh, what Matt said? I mean, people can approach this thing in a whole diff range of different ways. Um, some courts might find it useful to actually engage an outside consultant to assist the judges and the court staff in relation to the process. And bringing someone from outside who might be described as an honest broker can in fact help that process. Um, another thing that's been done, for example, in the District Court in New Zealand is to actually make sure that um, in relation to the questionnaire which people are involved in answering, that there's some direction given as to the types of things that um, should be taken into account when you're answering the questionnaire, to give some examples of the way in which things are done or could be done or might be done better. So there's a, there's a range of ways in which once you've made the initial decision to embark on this process, you can go about doing it. You don't need to slavishly for, follow any particular formula. You can do it in any way that you want to do it, really. Uh, 
Yeah, indeed. But um, for example, I can also imagine that if you hear for the first time uh, about this high court performance framework and the international framework of court excellence in your court, and when it is explained that you may feel as a judge or a court administration, what they are talking about. This is all management, leadership, it's about innovation, it's about human resources policies and so on. We process cases. This has nothing to do with cases. We have a quality system in place, namely a system of appeal or we focus on the quality of court decisions. How are you trying to convince those people, especially the conservative, part of the judiciary that it is necessary to introduce these models. Maybe you can answer to that, Violin? Yes, uh, because this dovetails nicely with how we started off in Bangladesh. Uh, as you can imagine, judges in Bangladesh were a little bit uh, reluctant initially to talk about excellence. Uh, the, their main concern was their, was their backlog, their backlog. But uh, one part of our projects was working on, on legal aid services. And in that context, we were having consultations with clients. So people who are indigent defendants who had had a lawyer paid by the state were brought together on a quarterly basis to discuss their experience. And they were asked, you know, how, how did they feel about the service? What went well? What did go well? And they tended to be very positive about their first contact with the court, how they had been helped to get a lawyer assigned to their case, but they all had the same complaint. It took too long. And when we brought back this information to judges, there was such a universality in terms of the response that was coming from, uh, from the users that there was then a desire to do something about it. Um, I think that while you know, each judge individually will be mostly focused on this caseload and, and adjudicating those cases fairly, independently, um, with a decision of quality, there is this recognition as well that the way that the public and especially the users that have come through the court perceive it matters. It does matter. We all, as human beings, would like to be perceived as having done a good job and be remembered positively. And if the only takeaway from the people we use the court is, it took too long, I didn't understand anything, I was not treated fairly or nicely, it triggers a, a little bit of a desire to, to start looking at what maybe could be done to, to improve. And that's what that, I found, was a very powerful motivator in, in sitting down and starting to think about, okay, what can we do about, about, about this? How can we improve? Mm -hmm. Okay, Matt. Uh, I've seen in the high court performance uh, of framework model that it's, it's largely data-driven. Let's say based on the uh, core tools, you have to collect all this data and information. Uh, Data is one thing, but how to balance it with, with the quality aspect? Um, how, is it, how do you keep the balance in the, in the model itself and how easy it is for courts to implement if your system is not optimally organized when it comes to core performance data, for example? I think at the core of this question is the, the two terms that are used for these frameworks. The first would be this notion of high performance and the other would be this notion of excellence. And I think around this room we would all agree that to achieve or to approximate this term of excellence for court management requires some sense of having reliable and consistent data upon which to make decisions or which to manage your organizational properties. So I, I certainly believe, again, that all courts can be improving, so maybe some are not approximating or coming close to this notion of excellence and don't have the right administrative data to begin to measure. Uh, we certainly have jurisdictions here in the United States that I've worked in who are unable to tell us how many judges there are, how many filings there are, how many dispositions, or even court staff in their courts. We would probably define those as courts of lesser excellence for sure. <laughs> so it's not limited just to data and I, I think a, a couple things about the, the data requirements or the data piece. Uh, Dan alluded to this 10 core performance measures that we call core tools and core tools were designed to tap into multiple dimensions, drawing on work that was done in the private sector. It's, uh, 
been developed in the vein of a balanced scorecard. So it's not just about efficiency measures. There are other dimensions in that, including things like employee satisfaction. We found that uh, if employees are engaged and happy with their job, they will treat litigants better and uh, they will do more work. They'll be providing innovative solutions and challenges, as well as this notion of access to justice, what Via Lane was discussing, procedural satisfaction. How does the litigant feel when confronted with the court? So there is a balanced set of these measures that take into account things like productivity, effectiveness, efficiency, and things of the procedural satisfaction vein. So absent this information, again, there is a, a way to enter this. I mentioned this 100 item survey or beginning to understand what uh, some of the challenges that confront a court. Or our jurisdiction. But at the end of the day, ultimately, as we know, the anecdotes sometimes that people tell are just stories and may not be true. So I'll just provide a, a simple example. If you ask your kid at, uh, during the year, How's your, how are you doing in school? The child might say, doing great. The report card comes back and you see a performance indicator, a measure of how well, and maybe they're failing their classes. So it's the, the performance indicators are going to give us insight into, again, the directions we need to go in a reliable and consistent way. So I do want to say, just from my own experience again, that we, we did, well, earlier uh, yesterday, we heard about Belize and creating this case management system. The story was that it actually wasn't that expensive. It wasn't that challenging to introduce. Uh, my own work with my colleague, Vailane, in Kosovo, when I was there a half a dozen years ago, they were at the beginning of uh, counting their cases and not doing a very good job. Well, we fast forward five years now, and any data request that I make to their statistical department is extremely sound, and they're able to deliver that, uh, again, with reliability to measure where backlogs are, measure where time to disposition may be too long, to be thinking about these interventions, as well as, again, uh, one of the tools in the court tools is this idea of access to justice, this procedural satisfaction. That requires actually conducting a survey of folks who come to the court. So this is an easy measure that any individual jurisdiction, multiple jurisdictions, a state or a country could implement with relatively easy and low cost to do to get critical information. So. The perspective of the National Center for State Courts and the high performing courts is we would like courts to measure something. If you can't do all 10 measures, that's okay. Measure what you can, but aspire to continue to improve your data collection because ultimately that data will allow you to make better decisions regarding your operations. But I think a critical point that was mentioned here just briefly is the idea of sharing that information back to key stakeholders, be it funding bodies in the US, it could be your county, it could be your state legislature, it could be your Ministry of Justice internationally, however that may be, and talking about performance and why there's a need for the resources you have or potentially for additional resources to improve your performance to provide better procedural satisfaction. Can, well, can, I, just, can I just add a comment to that, uh, which might be sound, um, uh, well, what, how shall I put it? Um, that I don't necessarily agree about the data side of it. I mean, I do to some extent, but data can be threatening. Um, I know in Australia, every year, courts publish through government a set of data and everyone's looking and comparing one with the other. And to that extent, it can be quite threatening. And often in relation to different statistical measures, there's great controversy about whether it does actually truly represent something. For example, what is a filing? What is the completion of a case? There are all of these definitional things associated with data, which I think to some extent make it difficult to say that it has the type of validity in this context that we might think. I don't know whether you have a comment about that. 
but is that not, let's say, the traditional arguments? I think judges hate it to be measured, especially in their performance, and they always have the standard argument, if you do that, you are attacking my judicial independent position, and uh, we decide how long a case will, a case will last, and, and not, let's say, leave it over to the administrators that collect all the performance data into detail, and they bring the reports and say, you are too slow as a judge. But maybe yeah. you have the... A respond to that, Violet? Well, not a response, but a but comment that maybe somewhere in between. Um, I agree that there's 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 big definitional differences. There can be even definitional differences within a, a single system. You know, one court may count certain things in a certain way and another one in a different way. So it's important to know what it is that you're actually looking at when you're looking at data. Um, but but there are there are a few things. That, that are useful when you start having some data. And I think the comparison is actually helpful. I think when data gets published and everybody looks to see how they fall within the system, it creates a certain dynamic of competition, which is not entirely negative if it kind of makes, creates aspirations of better performance. I think also it dispels some myths, and that's what is the most important maybe because, and I'll take an example of a country that will remain nameless, but in that particular country, in the capital city, the judges in the, court, in, the, in the court would always say, our situation is not the same. All the other judges have an easier situation. Their, their facilities are bigger because there's less judges in them. They have less cases than we do. We deal with all the hard work. Well, when data was published about the square metrage per judge inside court buildings, about the caseload per judge, about the, comp the composition of the caseload, the allocation of staff to judge, it turned out that that capital city court was right in the middle. That was actually the average. And it were a lot of those smaller jurisdictions where, where the situation was a little bit harder. But judges were processing their cases and sometimes being much more efficient. Um, and that maybe help both encourage those judges to continue to, to, to do well and to perform well, but maybe also call into question some of the complaints of exception, I would say, that were, that were regularly coming out of the capital city. I think that's important as a motivating factor. So uh, let me just uh, add on uh, briefly is uh, a couple points. I think one of the the real values of the court tools is that it provides very explicit standardized definitions of all data elements that go into the calculation of each measure. Of course, there could be other folks who disagree with that definition, but again, it, it provides a baseline of comparison, as VA Lane said, to either similarly situated jurisdictions or courts, comparisons to national standards, or even comparisons to baseline of previous years or previous times that measure has been measured. Uh, secondly, and this departs a little bit from the international community, while we certainly have evaluations of individual judges in certain states using a framework, the notion of evaluating performance of individual judges is different here in the United States. And the way the high performing court framework is established is that it's really looking at the court as an organization as a whole and is not assessing the individual performance of an individual, let's say, judge. It may look at divisions, could be the criminal division, the family division, the juvenile division, again, looking for areas for improvement, but it's not necessarily suggesting Judge X is doing so and so. However, having said that, many courts do find that publishing or sharing information about things like time to disposition, current backlog of cases at the judge level, at bench meetings between judges, is a way to actually potentially improve performance by shaming some of the slower judges and saying, why is it taking you twice as long for your caseload? Of course, there's contextual factors and reasons. The mixture and nature of some of the cases may be different, but absent of that, it's a way for accountability. So personally, I don't believe that being afraid to measure or the fear that judges have should be a barrier for why information about data should not be collected and should not be published. I think that uh, 
Judges around the world are hardworking and courts have a, a great mission to accomplish. And this is a way to hold individuals or organizations accountable to be meeting those missions. Well, it's an interesting point that you have mentioned, uh, let's say the relationship between uh, measuring the quality and performance as a court as a whole and the uh, performance of the individual judges. Um, now, in, in this uh, international framework of court excellence, there are a number of countries, at least I know New Zealand is one of them, that tries to connect the international framework of court excellence with the uh, judicial performance framework. And maybe you can uh, explain a bit more why New Zealand, for example, has chosen this well, specific approach. Yeah, New, it's still very much, I think, in the um, embryonic stage in New Zealand. There has been work done in relation to it. And then we're talking really now about the, the quality of the product that's ultimately produced. That is the judgment that the uh, particular judge actually puts out. Um, and we had a discussion yesterday at the consortium for the framework in relation to how we might do work in that particular space. Because uh, I think up until now, with the, the, the exception of what's been done um, in New Zealand that you can read about in the paper that uh, I mentioned earlier, that there's been a reluctance to actually look at quality in that sense because there's a concern that it does very much encroach upon judicial independence. Um, and how do you actually, at the end of the day, measure what the, the quality of a judgment is anyway? Um, so I think there are all of those problems that are associated with it. And um, certainly, with the exception of what's been done in New Zealand, I'm not really aware of it being um, uh, done elsewhere. Um, we have had in Victoria, where I come from, for example, um, uh, what's called a 360 degree assessment where um, people will actually be involved in uh, assessing a judge's performance, but on a very private basis with that judge in relation to how he or she conducts himself or herself in court. But that's a little bit different, I think, from the question of the quality of a judgment that is ultimately delivered. But to your opinion, it should be a good idea to include at least uh, some eighth area of uh, excellence uh, it's certainly focusing on quality of court decision. It's certainly something that um, we're looking at, but it has to be handled delicately. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. But uh, it can be done, to my opinion, because you can measure the quality of court decision in terms of understandability and clarity. And if it is well reasoned, for example, so there are objective criteria that can be applied, let's say, not criticizing the individual judge, but um, look at the court level to see if the quality of the court decisions are up to the standards, also from the viewpoint of the users of the court, for example. It's, it's a bit difficult, though, I think, Pim, to, to do that in a global sense rather than actually looking at individual judgments. I just don't think that you can, if, it's, if you're going to be realistic about it, look at the thing across the board. You've actually got to look at particular judgments, and that necessarily is going to mean that you're going to have to um, look at what a particular judge has done or said. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you want to respond? One more, uh, I think it goes back to the question about definitions of measurement. And I just want to give one example because it's also related to measuring performance of individual judges. Uh, one of the areas I work heavily in is this idea of workload assessment. And as I work internationally, one of the measures of productivity is thinking about uh, quotas, how many cases a judge will handle in a particular month. Could be you'd handle 20 cases of this particular type, and that's considered to be a, a good month. What we found is by having, in fact, a poor metric here, a, a bad measure, is that these judges will cherry pick the cases and pick the 20 easiest cases, and the most complex cases go in these shelves, and then there's delay and backlog of the complex cases. What workload does is provide a more sophisticated metric or measure that is a uh, little bit controversial because it takes time to explain and understand, but it weights different cases allowing, instead of the total number, to be thinking about how much work is involved with cases. As a quick example, in the U.S. context, an uh, average traffic case will take a judge significantly less time than an average felony criminal case. So we don't want to treat them one-to-one. -one. We would weight them 
And that's an area where defining the measures, thinking of what you're measuring, is just as important as measuring or you're developing a false picture of the reality in that court. So a judge who may look productive, in effect, is not being very productive relative to their colleagues by picking the easiest cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to wrap up at the end of this session by uh, also raising the question, what is the better model, the high court performance framework or the international framework of court excellence that uh, keeps in my mind every time? And uh, I would like to raise the question to Violin because you work for the National Center for State Courts. They have developed the high court performance framework. They have contributed to the international framework of court excellence. Why did you decide to use the international framework of court excellence in Bangladesh? Was it because the other uh, model was worse or our model was better? That's a good question. Uh, I, I, let me start by saying I don't think there's a better mode, model per se. There, there are two different approaches, two different ways of looking at the same um, improvement process. Uh, one is anchored in data and very focused, maybe has a narrower application. So it's very well suited to seeking to, to to identify and implement improvements in a court setting at the organizational level, bringing together a collegial kind of decision-making process to sift through data and, and decide, make management decisions towards improvements. Uh, the international framework, which predates the high-performance court framework, so maybe that will be my, my answer to, the, to why we used it in Bangladesh, is that I'm not sure the High performance court framework was entirely finished at the time we started off talking about it in, in Bangladesh. But it's much more process driven and maybe a little bit aspirational in nature. It's more adaptable, it can be used at the system level, at the organization level by a court, or even at the individual level by a judge, because it's about self assessment. It's about looking at, within my environment, which could be your individual environment as a judge or the environment of a court or the, the judiciary as a whole, within my environment and what I control, where and how can I affect change to address the set of problems that I've identified? And it made it a very, a, a more adapted tool to the discussions that we were having. That said, I think that both models seek to achieve the same thing, which is to help decision makers and groups of individuals within, within the justice sector to look at their system, their challenges, identify the problems, prioritize them, come up with solutions, implement them, and look at whether change, the change has been positive. And if not, come up with a different solution, if yes, tackle the next problem. And that helps, especially in environments where there are a lot of challenges. It helps bring a little bit of clarity into the overwhelming nature of the problem. And maybe in environments that are a little bit more advanced, it helps pursue real actual excellence to be at the top and to be leading towards innovation. Um, finally, the last thing I would say is that um, you can look at the international framework, international framework almost as building blocks. Um, so you have, you're looking at leadership first that, that enables you to develop policies and processes that enables you to tackle user satisfaction and issues of efficiency. If you look at the high performance court framework, it's more about looking at different elements of productivity, efficiency, fairness, um, and satisfaction of the employees and how to balance all those competing demands into something that's, that's um, in its maybe ideal composition for the, for the particular structure. So is it then also, Matt, better applicable the high uh, performance court framework in the United States only or you say, okay, it can be applied in other countries as well? And I still believe it is a better model. <laughs> I'm gonna... Just similar to Elaine, just uh, suggests that both approaches, I think, as she mentioned, are really rooted in the notion of performance measurement and performance management. Even if the measurement piece uh, 
is again some self-assessment. It's moving forward by using structured approaches to improve organizational through the, what Dan mentioned was this continuous improvement model. Having said that, I truly believe that the high performing core framework, as I mentioned, is a flexible set of steps that one can take to improve your court and your performance and that the applicability could be in Kosovo or Kenosha, Wisconsin. It's all the same. And, and I want to just stress, I think, one thing that Via Lane said is that one of the real strengths is by providing an explicit framework. Again, at the beginning, I mentioned there's no ideal, if we want to say a platonic ideal of what the perfect court should look like. So instead, what we have is a way to assess through this theoretical framework using this balanced perspective, some of these different components that are essential for higher performance. So court systems as a whole, or even court jurisdictions, one of the utilities has been used to assess, and I've heard at this conference people talk about strategic planning, whether or not your strategic planning efforts are in fact balanced and not hyper-focused on one particular area, but being by ensuring that that strategic plan can map to the 10 areas of the high performance court, it's taking into account internal perspectives, customer perspectives, this innovation perspective that relates to human capital, technology issues, information issues, and equally important, our external stakeholders and again, our funding bodies. So making sure that there is a balanced perspective in the approaches one takes even in these aspirational plans. So there are system-wide uses. It's certainly applicable to the individual trial courts. And I do believe that it would be equally applicable. Uh, just as one last example, the 100 item self-assessment survey that I mentioned uh, is being utilized in Bulgaria to help them identify their challenges and then link that directly back to performance measures that they have accessible for them to begin to build a better system in Bulgaria. Some final thoughts, Greg, um, very briefly. I'm just very briefly, I look, I, I, I take on board everything that has been said by Matt and Violaine, but uh, I, I, I think that it's important, no matter which model you actually ad, uh, adopt, that judges and court staff can be said in a very real sense to own the process, um, that it's not something that's said, said, seen to be imposed on them, um, whether externally or internally for that matter, that there's a degree of co uh, collegiality, cooperation in relation to the whole process. So I think they're the types of things that you need to bear in mind all of the time, no matter which of the systems you actually uh, adopt. Well, thank you very much for the, the panelists here. I think they have a, uh, provided a great overview of the two uh, models. Since we're running out of time, I would like to invite Dan uh, to explain a bit more where the, the battle will be continued. I think it will be in one of the breakout sessions. Well, well so far it's a split decision. And the, uh, the battle will continue with two uh, breakout sessions. One uh, following right after, the, where you're going to hear uh, from two courts that have implemented the international framework and two courts that have implemented the high performance courts. That follows this. Following that, there'll be a second breakout question that answers the question, how do you know we're staying on the path? And gets more into the measurement. Uh, with that, since we're out of time, uh, join me in thanking the panel for a most interesting discussion. <laughs>